Hello, dear students. Welcome to our video course. And today's lecture is the English language history and literature. And I'm your lecturer. My name is Kozlova Natalia Vasilyevna, and I am a teacher at Kuban State University, the Faculty of Romanic Germanic Philology. We are going to tell about English, its history, main phases of its development and literature specific to each phase. I hope you will enjoy the lecture. And now let's begin. The English language origin. First of all, we should know that English belongs to the Germanic group of languages. As a part of this group, it is characterized by polysemy, a phenomenon of existing multiple meanings for one lexical unit. For example, verbs sat, be, bear, short one or two syllable words, for example, sun, cat, sit, etc., and stressed first syllables, for example, in the words mother, father. However, throughout centuries, English was evolving, observing new words, grammar and spelling rules. For now, approximately one-third of English is native English. The rest consists of borrowings. The most influential languages in the English language formation are Latin and French. For example, wine, chair, machine, bouquet. Let's stop at the development of the English language. English is divided into three main stages of its development. They are Old English, Middle English and Modern English. Each phase is formed by particular historical events and characterized by specific features of word spelling and pronunciation. And now you will listen to the audio file where you can find out more about the development of English. Lesson 1C. Exercises 2 and 3. The history of the English language is a complicated one, mainly because it is inevitably linked with the history of Britain and its inhabitants. Languages, like populations, are influenced by wars, invasions, immigration, trade and many other factors. But in order to simplify the story of English, we often divide its history into three main phases. During the 5th century, Britain was invaded by Germanic tribes from mainland Europe, the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes. They displaced the existing population and their Celtic languages to the fringes of the country, Wales, Cornwall and the North. The languages of the invading tribes formed the basis of the English language. Today, we usually refer to this Anglo-Saxon language as Old English, and much of the vocabulary that we still use today has its roots in Old English, particularly words which are connected with their farming lifestyle. Earth, plough and sheep are three examples of words with Anglo-Saxon origins. Perhaps surprisingly, Old English did not borrow many words from the Celtic languages of ancient Britain, maybe because the two populations did not really mix. One of the few is the word Britain itself. Another is the name of London's main river, the Thames. It did borrow words from Latin, however. School is one example, as well as adopting the Roman alphabet, which is still used today to write English and many other languages. Between about 800 and 1000 AD, Viking invaders from Norway and Denmark came to Britain, settling mainly in the northern and eastern parts of the country. Many words from their language, Old Norse, became part of Old English, and some of these survive to this day, such as the common verbs get, take, and want. The transition from Old English to Middle English happened gradually, beginning around the 11th century. Grammar became much simpler. In Old English, there is a complex system of inflections, just as there is in German or Latin. 
but in Middle English there are very few inflections. To avoid this resulting in ambiguity, the word order becomes more rigid. In other words, we can tell which noun is the subject of a verb and which is the object, not by the endings of the nouns, but by the fact that the subject comes before the verb and the object comes after. This is, of course, a feature of modern English, too. As well as the grammar, the vocabulary of Middle English is different from Old English. For example, it contains a lot of French words. This is because Britain was conquered by the Normans from northern France in 1066. For the next 300 years or so, Britain was ruled by the French, and the Anglo-Saxon population were mainly deprived of power and wealth. The superior social position of the French during that time is reflected even today in some of the words we use. For example, the words for the meats beef and mutton come from the French words boeuf and mouton, while the words cow and sheep originally come from Anglo-Saxon. This reflects the fact that the Anglo-Saxon peasants had to look after the animals so that their French masters could dine on the meat. The third phase, modern English, is generally agreed to begin around the time that the printing press was invented at the end of the 15th century. In the 1700s, the first dictionaries of English began to record vocabulary. The spelling of words became more stable. Up to this time, writers used to spell a word however they wanted to. And as science flourished, thousands of new words were added to the English language. The majority taken from Greek, for example, microscope and biology, or Latin, such as the word science itself. The process of change is a continuous one, and there is no reason to think that modern English will be the final and everlasting form of the language. On the contrary, it is already being transformed by several powerful influences. One of them is the Internet. Another related influence is the global community of non-native speakers of English, which far outnumbers the community of native speakers. What will the English language be like in the future? Nobody can be sure, but it will certainly not be the same as the English of today. After listening, you may check your comprehension in the self-checked task. English Literature Oral and Written the very first writings on what is now Great Britain were in several different languages. Latin, of course, since the Romans had occupied these islands for some four centuries. Gallic and Irish and Welsh also found written expression. Of course, most literature was part of an oral tradition, and it was rarely written down until much later. Literature is as old as human language, and literature is everywhere. Not only in books, but in videos, television, radio, CDs, computers, newspapers, in all the media of communication where a story is told or an image created. It starts with words and with speech. The first literature in any culture is oral. In English, the first signs of oral literature tend to have three kinds of subject matter – religion, war, and the, re and the trials of daily life, all of which continue as themes of a great deal of writing. The first text we have from more than one and a half thousand years ago come down to us in Old English and over the centuries they show influences of Norse and Viking, Anglo-Saxon and French invaders, as well as local regional dialects. Only after about 1400, when what we call Middle English took over, does literature in English begin to sound, look and feel like the English we use today. By the time of Shakespeare and the King James Bible, published in 1611. The English language is recognizably modern. The spread of Anglo-Saxon, then English as a language, 
was one of the most significant elements over cent several centuries in molding a national identity out of all the cultural and linguistic influences which the country underwent. Icelandic and Viking, Latin and French, Germanic and Celtic, as well as many local linguistic, cultural and social forces were all part of the Anglo-Saxon melting pot, which would eventually become English, the language of England, then of Britain. The first fragment of literature is known as Cadman Hymn. It dates from the late 7th century. The hymn is therefore the first song of praise in English culture, and the first Christian religious poem in English, although many Latin hymns were known at, the, at that time. It was preserved by the monks of Whitby. Christian monks and nuns were the guardians of culture, as they were virtually the only people who could read and write before the 14th century. It is interesting, therefore, that most of the native English culture they preserved is not in Latin, the language of the Church, but in Old English, the language of the Angles, Saxon and Jutes. Old English poetry is characterized by a number of poetic tropes, which enable a writer to describe things indirectly and which require a reader imaginatively to construct their meaning. The most widespread of these figurative descriptions are what are known as cannings. Cannings often occur in compounds, for example, Ron Red, or Whale Road, or Swan Road, like Swan Road, meaning the sea, Banhus, Bone House, meaning the human body. Some cannings involve borrowing or inventing words, often appear to be chosen to meet the alliterative requirement of a poetic line, and as a result some cannings are difficult to decode, leading to disputes in critical interpretation. But cannings do allow more abstract concepts to be communicated by using more familiar words. For example, God is often described as Monkenis weird or guardian of mankind. One of the most famous epic poem of that time is Beowulf. It stands out as a poem which makes extensive use of this kind of figurative language. There are over 1000 compounds in the poem totaling one-third of all the words in the text. Many of these compounds are cannings. The word to can is still used in many Scottish and Northern English dialects, meaning to know. Such language is a way is of knowing and of expressing meaning in striking and memorable ways. It has continuities with the kinds of poetic compounding found in nearly all later poetry, but especially in the modernist texts of Gerard Manley Hopkins and James Joyce. Writers in what we now call the Middle English period, late 12th century to 1485, did not necessarily always write in English. The language was in a state of flux. Attempts were made to assert the French language to keep down the local language English and to make the language of the church Latin the language of writing. These European influences were largely channeled through London, now the capital city of the Kingdom of England. The Kingdom was quite different geographically from present-day Britain. It extended into several regions of France and from 1284 included Wales, but did not include Scotland. A distinctive stylistic feature of the Middle English period was a rapid expansion in the number of words. These words often entered the language from Latin, but by the majority of imports were French. 
and indeed some of the Latin words may have arrived through the vehicle of French. Middle English vocabulary thus often has sets of words, each with a different origin and each conveying more or less the same meaning, but with different patterns of use. For example, some modern equivalents are ask, question and interrogate in Old English, French and Latin accordingly. There are also the following groups of synonyms kingly, Old English, royal, French and regal, Latin or holy, Old English, sacred, French and consecrated, Latin fire, Old English, flame, French, conflagration, Latin or sheep, Old English and mutton, that is, a borrowing from French. In each case, the Old English derived lexical items are generally more frequent in English and more colloquial and are more central and core to the language. The words of Latin origin are more formal, learned and bookish in their use. The French words are considered to be more literary in function. It can also be noted that the French words confer a more elevated style on words used in domestic domains. After the Norman conquest, the language of the Norman ruling class was Northern French. The language of the English court in the 12th century was Parisian French which carried more prestige than Anglo-Norman or other varieties. Until the second half of the 14th century, the language of instruction in English schools was French. And now we want to talk about Geoffrey Chaucer, one of the greatest representative of English literature of that time. The range and variety of Chaucer's English did much to establish English as a national language. Chaucer also contributed much to the formation of a standard English based on the dialect of the East Midlands region, which was basically the dialect of London which Chaucer himself spoke. Indeed, by the end of the 14th century, the educated language of London bolstered by the economic power of London itself, was beginning to become the standard form of written language throughout the country, although the process was not to be completed for several centuries. The cultural, commercial, administrative and intellectual importance of the East Midlands, one of the two main universities, Cambridge, was also in this region, the agricultural richness of the region and the presence of major cities, Norwich and London, contributed much to the increasing standardization of the dialect. At the end of the 14th century, the world changed. Two key dates can mark the beginning of modern times. In 1485, the Wars of the Roses came to an end, and, following the invention of printing, William Caxton issued the first imaginative book to be published in England, Sir Thomas Mallory's retelling of the Arthurian legends, The Death of Arthur. In 1492, Christopher Columbus had a voyage to the Americas. He opened European eyes to the existence of the New World. New worlds, both geographical and spiritual, are the key to the Renaissance, the rebirth of learning and culture, which reached its peak in Britain during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I from 1558 to 
1603. England emerged from the Wars of the Roses with a new dynasty in power, the Tudors. As with all powerful leaders, the question of succession became crucial to the continuation of power. So it was with the greatest of the Tudor monarchs, Henry VIII, whose reign lasted from 1509 to 1547. In his continued attempts to father a son and heir the line, Henry married six times, but his six wives gave him only one son and two daughters, who became King Edward VI, Queen Mary I and Queen Elizabeth I. The need for the annulment of his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon brought Henry into direct conflict with the Catholic Church, and with Pope Clement VII in particular. In reaction to the Catholic Church's rulings, Henry took a decisive step which was to influence every aspect of English life and culture from that time onwards. He ended the rule of the Catholic Church in England, closed the monasteries, which had for centuries been the repository of learning, history and culture, and established himself as both the head of the Church and head of state. This move is known as the Reformation, and its importance is huge. Literature before Renaissance had frequently offered ideal patterns for living which were dominated by the ethos of the Church, but after the Reformation the search for individual expression and meaning took over. This involved experimentation with form and genre, and an enormous variety of linguistic and literary innovations in a short period of time. The Reformation gave cultural, philosophical and ideological impetus to English Renaissance writing. The writers in the century following the Reformation had to explore and redefine all the concerns of humanity. The Bible has been one of the major shaping influences in the development of the English language. However, the history of the relationship between the Bible and the English language has been alone and at times controversial one. For example, in 1382, John Wycliffe translated the Vulgate edition of the Bible, published in Latin, into Middle English, but caused controversy because many people believed that English was not a language worthy of conveying the profound moral sentiments of the Bible. Over 150 years later, William Tyndale translated the New Testament into English from the original Greek, seeking in the process to produce a version of the Bible which could be accessible to anyone who could read. He was a strong proponent of the view that people should be able to read the Bible in their own language and accordingly contributed much to the development of a plain colloquial English style. Other influential Bibles in English were the Coverdale Bible, which was a translation from German and the first complete Bible to be published in English, and the Bishop's Bible which was a revised version of the Great Bible. The most important and influential Bible was, however, the King James Bible, published in 1611 and also known as the Authorized Version. In 1604, the new king, King James I, wanted to have a version of the Bible which would become the single standardized version for use in all churches and throughout the country, and ordered a panel of scholars and translators to produce a version on which there could be general agreement and which would be acceptable to the bishops of the country. 
In terms of grammar, the authorized version of the Bible maintains an older word order. For example, they knew him not, instead of they did not know him, and things eternal for eternal things. The suffixes eth and th, third person singular form of present tense verbs, is common. For example, God does know, for God does know, and your cup runneth over, for your cup runs over. Some several irregular verbs appear in older forms, for example, spake, for spoke, Wist for new and get for got. Above all, however, phrases, proverbial expressions, and sayings which occur in the authorized version are now so much part of everyday English that their origins are hardly ever recognized. For example, money is the root of all evil, all things to all men the blind leading the blind, and at their wit's end. The 16th century witnessed not only geographical and intellectual expansion, but also a rapid growth in the number of foreign words, which became English words. English as a language had always been open to lexical invasions, and by the time of the Renaissance had observed innumerable words with Latin and Greek origins, but had also borrowed many words from French, Italian, Spanish and Portuguese, other countries similarly involved in an expansion of their usual territorial boundaries. During the 16th century, however, and in a time of worldwide exploration and expansion, new words came into English from over 50 other languages, including the languages of Africa, Asia, and North America. The lexicon of English expanded to meet the need to talk about the new concepts, especially scientific concepts, inventions, materials, and descriptive terms which accompanied the rapidly developing fields of medicine, technology, science, and the arts. The expansion of the lexicon of English owes much to the linguistic creativity of Shakespeare, whose inventions have become a part of modern English idiom, although the same meanings are not necessarily preserved. At the time of Shakespeare, the English language was in a state of rapid transition. The fluidity of the language was utilized by Shakespeare to coin new phrases, to introduce new words, to innovate in idiom, and regularly to exploit the newly forming grammar and spelling patterns of modern English for purposes of creative ambiguity. Shakespeare's more distinctive uses of language are, however, more deeply patterned in the ideas and themes of his prose and poetry. On the level of vocabulary choices, key recurring words such as time in Macbeth or honest in Othello or act in Hamlet resonate across a whole play. But the choices in words do not only convey particular meanings, they also enact meanings. For example, in Macbeth, Shakespeare exploits tensions between formal Latin-derived vocabulary and more informal native English vocabulary for purposes of dramatic effect. A related contrast between formal Latinate and informal Anglo-Saxon diction occurs in a number of plays in which different ways of seeing are contrasted. Throughout plays, the double voice is an essential element of characterization. At its most creative, Shakespeare's language is iconic. That is, there is a connection between some aspects of the linguistic expression and the event or object or character it refers to. 
Nowadays, we use many idioms created by Shakespeare, but doing it, we usually do not realize and do not know their origins. Look at the following examples. It's Greek to me. We use it when we don't understand a word, when the subject is too complicated to comprehend it. It's Greek to me means Я не понимаю ни слова. Это темный лес для меня. The next example is fair play or foul play. We use these expressions to show that something is honest or dishonest. So, fair play means честная игра по-честному, and foul play means нечестная или грязная игра. The expression dead as a doornail means absolutely dead. Совершенно мертвый. Мертвее не бывает. The phrase to vanish into thin air is used when we speak about something that disappeared suddenly without any tracks left. To vanish into thin air means раствориться в воздухе, исчезнуть без следа. Another example is a laughing stock. We use it to describe a person or an object that is laughed at by the others. A laughing stock means посмешище. For goodness sake. We use this expression when we are irritated or surprised. For goodness sake, ради Бога, во имя всего святого. Talking about modern English, we can't avoid discussing one more type, one more phase of English language development. That is global English. Nowadays, English is still developing. Among old and merely obsolete words, a great amount of neologism occur on a regular basis. It is strongly connected with the process of globalization. Many people around the world speak English as their first or second language, which account for its changes and further evolution as an inseparable part of English and, what is more, global culture. Now you will watch the video about global English. There are over 6,000 languages in the world. Mandarin Chinese and Spanish are the world's most common first languages. And for about 370 million people, English is their first language. But for most people around the world, English is neither a first or second language. Even in a city like London, English is sometimes a second or possibly a third or fourth language of many of the residents. But it is estimated that one out of four people worldwide speak English with some degree of competence. And as a result, English is often used as a common language of international communication. For example, 
It's been the mandated language of international aviation since 2008. English was chosen in an attempt to avoid any misunderstandings between international flight crews and air traffic controllers. While the English language is derived from an historic variety of languages, by and large, native English speakers are poor at learning other languages. As a result, many native English speakers grow up never having got to grips with a second language. But in some countries, like South Africa and India, while English isn't the first language of most of the population, it's widely used as the language of education, science, commerce and the internet. But English coexists with many native languages. English is just one of South Africa's 11 official languages. Nearly a quarter of the population of 50 million people speak Zulu as their first language. And another 20% speak Kosa. Afrikaans is the third biggest first language. About 13% of the population speak Afrikaans. A very similar language to Dutch. English is the first language of only 8% of the population. But over 45% of people speak it as a second language and to communicate with speakers of other languages. South Africa uses English as the main language of business, politics and the media. All students in South Africa have to learn English at school. Today there are a lot of English words used in languages like Zulu and Kosa. But many words from these languages are also incorporated into South African English, enriching all the languages. But the prevalence of English as a growing global language has some problematic implications too. There have been accusations of linguicide levelled against English. The sheer dominance of the English language is literally killing minority languages. In some countries, there are no longer any native speakers of many local languages. And, with no one to pass it on to the next generation, the language dies. This has already happened to many of the indigenous languages of the Native American Indians in North America. But it's unlikely that anything can stop the continued expansion of the English language in the short term. And with the influence of globalization and the internet, it is very likely that the dominance of English will continue, at least for the foreseeable future. After watching the video, you may examine yourself with the help of self-checked task. For now, our video lecture is over. I hope that you have enjoyed and learned a lot of new. Thank you for your attention. Goodbye.